This stunning koi pond is one many of you may recognise. Photographs and videos posted online have been shared, reshared, and shared again. The pond always attracts a lot of interest, and with its unfortunate decommission imminent, I thought I'd take a final opportunity to share this wonderful pond with the world of Nishkigoi. This was Shane's very first attempt at building a koi pond. Now whilst the majority of first koi ponds look like a toddler designed them, Shane's has a visual finesse that will leave many koi keepers green with envy. This 4,000 gallon gravity fed system is fitted with two bottom drains, three large infinity windows and was constructed using concrete blocks before being waterproofed with a box weld liner. The pond has a fairly conventional filtration system, utilising a drum filter, fluidised K1 chambers, a shower filter containing ceramic media and also a bead filter. If you'd like to know the full technical breakdown, please see the video description. A detail I feel worth mentioning is how Shane's installed his shower filter. The shower filter is fed by a large volume pump that sits in the last chamber of the main filter. The water is fired over the shower filter and then drops back into the first moving bed chamber before making its way back through the system. This method is becoming increasingly popular as it means shower filters can be hidden out of sight. A real bonus considering they're not the most attractive pond side features. Installing one this way also means you can substantially increase the flow rate over the shower filter without affecting the total turnover rate of your pond. Very clever stuff, especially as this can be utilised on a pump fed system as well. Shane is blessed with soft source water and the pond naturally sits at a pH of around 7.2. He does however struggle with high levels of chlorine and chloramine, which is often a common trade-off in soft water areas. To counteract this, he uses a six-stage big blue purification system, deploying coconut carbon, bone carbon and catalytic carbon in succession. He said this took a little trial and error, but it does seem to do the job. At the time of filming, there were around 15 koi in the pond. The only small one was a rather nice 35cm golden corn from Taniguchi. There she is. The rest are all well over 65cm, with the largest being a lovely Karashigoi that's around 95cm long. We took the time to bowl a few of the residents, hence the random koi shots appearing on the left. My favourite had to be a 90cm Yamabu Kyogon from Izumiya. We only lifted her in the net, but the quality really stood out. Being honest, even with 15 koi, I do feel the pond is a little overstocked considering the size of some of its inhabitants. Shane mentioned how the pond has always suffered with poor flow dynamics due to a construction error, and this ultimately impacted the pond's functionality and also the koi. I wonder if a lower stocking rate would have perhaps eased the pressure these floors placed on the system. Now obviously stocking levels are always a personal choice, but I do believe that for hobbyists looking for an easier life, stocking light is definitely the way to go. It might surprise you that such an impressive looking koi pond has floors, but the truth is most ponds do. Often they're oversights that don't reveal themselves until the whole system is up and running, at which point we usually have to make do or cry ourselves to sleep. Speaking with Shane, I asked him what he would offer fellow hobbyists as his best bit of advice. He talked about the importance of proper planning, aim to build one pond, get it right first time and don't skimp. I think that's pretty solid advice to be honest. Taking the time to plan properly and having your design scrutinised by koi people with knowledge is the best way to avoid potential errors. Obviously everyone works to different budgets, but by speaking to experienced enthusiasts, you'll be able to gauge where certain savings can be made and where skimping simply isn't an option. Remember, the cheapest way to build a koi pond is to build it once.
to be honest, it's a bit bittersweet visiting this lovely koi pond knowing that Shane will soon take a sledgehammer to it. Some might say that's not the most positive advertisement for the koi hobby, but actually it's a topic worth consideration. Shane decided to call it a day because he felt he was fighting a constant battle and that ultimately there was more to go wrong than to enjoy. Now the koi hobby can be extremely challenging and frustrating at times, but I think it's important to remember that ups and downs are a part of the hobby, much like they're a part of life. Our ponds and koi are living things and because of this, anything can happen. In fact, the chances are everything will happen at some point, the good, bad and ugly. However, if you're constantly coming up against the same hurdles and indeed the bad stuff is outweighing the good, then I would say you're experiencing something more than just a run of bad luck. Chances are there'll be something you haven't got quite right and perhaps the smallest tweak could make all the difference, which in turn could save your hobby. If Shane was still on the fence with his decision, then I would tell him to halve his stocking levels and try for another season. But his mind was already made and sometimes we do just fall out of love with things and that's okay. Is it sad? Uh, no, not really. Not for Shane. Shane's getting a jacuzzi in a fire pit. How the other half live, eh? Well, I never liked him anyway. <laughs>